A good Wednesday evening to you. This is Pastor Jones here at Valley Assembly of God, Hagerstown, Maryland, welcoming you to our midweek oasis service where we can come and fellowship, not only with one another, but with the Lord and find refreshment and be recharged and strengthened for the remainder of the week. And I appreciate you coming this way. And we hope tonight, once again, will be a blessing to you. We are still in the parables of Christ, and we're going to start something tonight that I will finish next week. We are going to be in the 15th chapter of the Gospel of Luke. While you're turning, let me just remind you that we're here Sunday morning, 9 o'clock, at the Bible study hour. If you've not been in Bible study, we've got from the youngest child to the oldest adult, you need to start this coming week. Get back into the Word of God. 10 o'clock is morning worship with Children's Church going on. We're back Sunday night for our Sunday evening service, offering Royal Rangers and Girls Ministries for the boys and girls. Monday is prayer meeting at 12 noon. And then, of course, uh, don't forget, we're back here Wednesday night. Youth group meets, children's ministries, and then after a time of praise and worship, we're right back into in-depth Bible study. Tonight, we want to talk about Christ and the lost. And I'm using the second verse as my text, although we'll be making reference to this entire chapter here in the 15th chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Christ and the lost. And the verse is this. This man receiveth sinners. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word now tonight open before us. We pray, God, that once again, as always, that you would bring your word alive to us that you would anoint your messenger. And Father, that we, we, we might leave this time together enriched and strengthened and drawn closer to you. And Lord, with a greater insight and revelation of your divine truth. Have your wonderful way now, we pray, Father. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're talking about the parables of the lost sheep, the lost coins, the lost sons today. Jesus is speaking to an audience in this setting that's not made up of the morally fit. It's rather made up of those who are keenly conscious of the fact that they have made a mess of things. They've made a mess of their lives. I think in some regards we've all been there. But they listen with wide-eyed eagerness. They press about him as starving men Press about one who is dispensing bread when they're starving. It is easy to see that their deepest needs are being met. Their deepest hopes, dead, are now being resurrected. Christ is making a difference. It is a sight, it would seem, to thrill and gladden the hearts of the most selfish and indifferent that might be surrounding this crowd. But strange to say, the scribes and the Pharisees, the religious people of that moment in time, are not gladdened in the least bit. They are rather filled with indignation. They fairly grind their teeth with rage, and in their anger they spit out a criticism of Jesus that they consider absolutely damning. They do not accuse him of catering to the rich while he neglects the poor. They do not accuse him of religious snobness like themselves. This is their bitter accusation. This man receiveth sinners. And what is Jesus to say in reply to that? He does not answer by a hot denial while his face glows with shame. That's not what we see here. He rather accepts her accusation as absolutely true. In fact, he takes her criticism as his text and preaches this marvelous sermon that we find recorded in this 15th chapter of the Gospel of Luke. It's a sermon made up of four parables. There's the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coins, the parable of the lost son in the far country, and the parable of the lost son at home. But these four parables are really united 
into a single connected story by one word. And that one word is lost. Lost. Here we find the very heart of what Jesus teaches about the lost and about God's attitude towards them. This is something I need to know. It's something you need to know. The first thing we want to look at is that text I read a moment ago. This man receiveth sinners. Who are sinners? That's a question. They are those who are lost. And who are the lost? They are not necessarily those who have become wrecks and renegades. They are not those who are hopelessly doomed and damned. They are rather those who are out of the relationship, a right relationship. Jesus here mentions four different types of lost men. First one, there are those who are lost in the sense of which they stray like the lost sheep. This sheep was not lost in the sense that it had fallen to its death over the side of a cliff or rather been devoured by some wild beast. It was still alive. It was lost in that it was away from the shepherd. It was away from the flock. Losing the shepherd, it had lost its guide. It had no sense of direction. It didn't know the way back to the fold. And there are a multitude like that today that are lost in exactly the same way. You have lost sight of God. You have lost sight of the church. You have no sense of direction. And you, are, you have no way of getting back. You don't know which path to take. They're masterless men. They have flung away from the old authorities but have found no new ones that command them. They have no fixed star by which to steer their course. They have become morally and spiritually adrift. If that is not a picture of America today, I don't know what is. And I hate to say it, it is somewhat of a picture of God's church today. And all such, according to Jesus, are lost. We see secondly here, then there are those who are lost in the sense of which the piece of silver was lost. The coin was not lost in that it had ceased to be silver. Nor was it lost because it no longer bore the image and subscription of the emperor. It was lost in that it was out of circulation. Being out of circulation, it rendered no service. It was useless. And just so Jesus reckons as lost every man or woman who is out of circulation, every man or woman who is making no helpful contact with their fellow man. In fact, the sin of sins, according to Jesus, is uselessness. When you and I fail to be the salt and the light in this earth, we have become useless. Every parable of judgment was uttered not against those guilty of some positive wrong, but against those who had failed in their duty. The man who buried his talent, the bridesman who had, bridesmaid who had no oil, the man who moved amongst the needy and did nothing to meet their needs. All these were utterly condemned from the lips of Jesus. And there are many such among us today. Often their sympathies are with the church. Their names are even on the church roll. And yet they do not pass as legal tender in any helpful enterprise that you can find. They are seen so infrequently in the services of the church. You cannot beg them to come back on a Sunday night or Wednesday night. Nothing moves them. They are not squandering their talents. They are, are only burying their talents. Jesus looks upon all such as lost. And this is true regardless how, however decent 
and clean and upright they might be in their own personal lives. They are lost in the eyes of God. And thirdly, there are those who are lost in the sense in which the prodigal son was lost. Here is a type whose lostness is obvious to you and I. It is obvious to himself and to others. He's not at home. Where do we find him? He's in a far country. He's not a worker. He is a waster. He's not lifting up. He's dragging down those about him. He's not creating. This prodigal is destroying, including himself. Every man who's squandering his God-given energies in a way hurtful to himself and hurtful to others, every man who is doing a poor second best when he might be doing the best is a true sense wasting his substance and is reckoned by Jesus as lost. As God looks at you right now, what does he reckon you? Fourthly, and finally in this segment, there are those who are lost as was his elder son. His type is seldom counted as lost, either by himself or others. This makes his condition all the more hopeless, this elder brother. He is not away in a far country amongst the swine, as the case of the prodigal brother. He is in an environment that is wholesome, it's clean. Now the elder brother was in the field, the Bible said. He was out there where the skies were blue above his head, out there where he breathed the fragrance of new mown hay and sweet aroma of upturned soil. He was no waster as his brother was. This man was a worker. His sleeves are rolled up. Sweat comes down his brow. He's dirty by the work and labor of the day. The fact that he was in the field indicates that he was a toiler. In what sense then is this decent and earnest and hardworking son lost? He is lost in that he is absolutely out of sympathy with both his father and his brother. His father grieves over the fact that the younger brother is in the far country. His brother, this elder brother, doesn't give it a second thought. He put himself there. So let him suffer the consequences. But this elder brother, he doesn't grieve. He's being away, his being away is to him a matter of no importance whatsoever. This or that his father should break his heart over such a trifle seemed to him as utter foolishness. Stop your crying, Dad. Stop worrying about him. He, he made his bed. Let him lay in it now. That would be his attitude and disposition. Then when the prodigal returns, his father rejoices greatly. But there is no joy on the part of the industrious son. He has no love for the father nor for his brother. And Jesus reckons as lost every loveless man or woman. Every man or woman who looks upon his brother and sister with cold and critical eyes regardless of how utterly his despised brother may have wasted his substance with riotous living. What are your feelings about those that are lost and undone? Those of your own family, do you care about them? Do you think about them at all? Listen, if we, the church, can't reach them, if we can't pray for them, if we can't grieve for them, who in the world will? And then secondly tonight, and I'm going to just look at one point, and then we'll pick up the rest next week. Jesus who receiveth sinners indicates that some of the varied ways in which we become sinners. In other words, we want to answer this question. How do we get lost? How does that happen? 
One point tonight before we close. There are those who get lost just as the sheep got lost. How did the sheep come to stray? How was that possible? It did not do it intentionally. No, uh-uh. It did not become angry at the shepherd and the flock and definitely determined to break both with both of them. It rather got lost because it was silly and careless. One day it became interested in its grazing and went from one tuft of green grass to the next and wandered here and wandered there. And then all of a sudden, when it looked up, the flock was nowhere to be found. The shepherd was nowhere to be found. Wow. It strayed away thoughtlessly and without being conscious at first that it was lost. This happened as a type in my wife and I's life years and years ago when our girls were small. And we were at Disney World and there was a parade. We were standing together, not just Karen and I, but our children and also my brother-in-law and his wife and, and their children. And we were watching and just, you know, entering into the festivities and we looked around and Christine was gone. We looked here, looked there, we couldn't find her. My brother-in-law and my sister-in-law and my wife, we began to run through the crowd, going here, there and thither, calling out her name. We had just seen a bunch of posters coming into Disney that day of lost children on milk containers. And all of a sudden our hearts sunk. We thought somebody had taken her. Fear filled us. And then, thank God, as my wife looked over and standing in the crowd, gazing at the parade, not realizing she had wandered away from us, there she stood. And Karen reached out and grabbed her and pulled her in. Boy, what a relief. Did she purposely wander off? Did she purposely get lost? Did she purposely fill us with fear that someone had taken her? No. But nevertheless, for those few moments in time, she was lost. How many are lost that I'm talking to tonight? Not because you intended to get lost. It just happened. The same is often the case with ourselves. Few of us break with God and fling away from our convictions deliberately and maliciously. That's not how it happens. We drift away carelessly and unconsciously. For instance, we get busy and we little by little leave off our church attendance. Things come up. A man said to me some years ago, he said, Pastor, thank God we're back. He said, there was a day we were coming to church and serving God, but we slept in on one Sunday morning, and then it led to a second time we slept in. And he said, I woke up one day, and I found out we had been gone for two years. Did they purposely do it? No, but it happened. It happened. Little by little, we leave off our religious practices such as reading the Bible and prayer every day. Almost unconsciously, we drift into other practices that war against our spirituality because, you see, where God does not fill the vacuum and void in our life, the world and, the, and self will. Until the sense of God has slipped away from our lives. Even Mary... When Christ was lost, without at first being conscious of her loss, he wasn't with them when they left. Panic filled them when they looked around and couldn't find him. No wonder, therefore, the writer to the Hebrews gives us this wise word of warning. We ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. Lest, listen now, at any time we drift away from them. Men are getting lost every day by allowing themselves to drift. Is that you? Are you moving closer to God every day? If you're not, 
then you're drifting and you're moving away from him. Come back to God tonight. Rededicate and consecrate yourself to the Lord and get your name out of that column of lost and get it back into the column of found and saved. My friends, you'll not regret it. Next week, we'll pick up where we left off. You will not want to miss it. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you now for this time we've enjoyed together. Thank you for the life that reverberates in your word and the truth that emanates from it. I pray tonight you've spoken to us, Lord, and that, God, we will use every precaution lest we would drift and become lost. I ask you, Lord, tonight prepare us for the remainder of the week ahead and prepare us for the Sunday that's coming. Keep a safe hand upon us, Lord, and meet every need we pray. We cannot thank you enough. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Once again, thank you for joining with us tonight. I, I enjoyed this study tonight. I hope you enjoyed it as much with me. You'll not want to miss next week. You have a blessed remainder of the week. Hope to see you Sunday, and God bless you until we meet again.